In part one of Fan Casting the Bat Family, we cover Dick Grayson, Kate Kane, Barbara Gordon, and Jason Todd. Now, we're going for the younger four. Tim Drake, Stephanie Brown, Cassandra Kane, and Damian Wayne. Those two groups together are what I would consider the big eight. There are plenty of other important characters, and I cover some of those in videos that you can watch right now on Nebula. First one was older characters, Batmite, Carrie Kelly, and Azrael. The new one is more recent characters, Duke Thomas, aka The Signal, Luke Fox, aka Batwing, and Minkoa Khan, aka The Ghostmaker. Boy, do I love The Ghostmaker. If you are not familiar, you're in for a treat. I'll explain how to watch the video later, but now we've got a lot to cover, so let's start with the Robin who changed everything. Tim Drake is the best Robin. Tim Drake's story starts simple and gets way more complicated, but the easy stuff up front. Tim Drake is a kid growing up in Gotham City who goes to the circus one night, like you do. Question, do people like go to the circus anymore? Like, is that a common event like it was back in Bruce Wayne's day? Or is the modern Nightwing gonna need to be created at like a Cirque du Soleil? Anyway, Tim Drake goes to Haley's Circus to see his favorite family trapeze act, the Flying Graysons. And that happens to be the night that all of the Flying Graysons, but one, are killed. Time passes, Batman takes on his first Robin, and Tim notices something. Robin can do a quadruple somersault, a feat that had only previously been performed by the Flying Graysons. And Tim gets an idea. What if this Robin kid is Dick Grayson? After all, the timeline's up, Robin debuts right after the tragedy of Haley's Circus, and he's around the right age and hair color, he's unbelievably acrobatic, this must be Dick Grayson. And that means Batman must be Dick Grayson's guardian, billionaire playboy Bruce Wayne. So what does Tim do with this information? Not much. I mean, he does not want to blackmail Bruce or do anything to make his life more difficult, but Tim does decide to train, mentally and physically. So if the opportunity presents itself, he can help Batman and Robin. Fast forward things a bit. Tim notices something else. Batman has been acting sort of aggressive, violent, angry, and Tim gets an idea. He knows that Jason Todd died and has figured out that Jason Todd was the second Robin. And Tim theorizes that Batman is lashing out because Batman does not have a Robin. He needs a sidekick to keep him in check. So Tim takes this information to Dick and Alfred and Dick agrees. Batman needs a Robin. But Dick can't be Robin again, he's too old and has moved beyond that mantle. And then Dick leaves Tim alone in the Batcave with the Robin suit, signaling that he believes Tim should be the new Robin, and Tim makes this face. Now it took a lot of work to convince Bruce, who still felt very guilty after what happened to Jason, but over some time, Bruce agreed and Tim became Robin. And he was pretty amazing at it. He's not as good of an acrobat as Dick or as good of a brawler as Jason, but Tim outmatched them at pretty much everything else. He was made for this. And Batman recognized that. He knew talent when he saw it. And they were a solid team. Until Batman, you know, he got baned. That's right. Tim was the Robin who went to deal with that. Had to help John Paul Valley, aka Azrael, take over as Batman and watch Valley go insane. I talk about that in a Nebula exclusive casting video, which you can watch right now, where I focus on Azrael. But the short story is Batman picked a replacement Batman who seemed competent and then turned into a very 90s radical murder machine, forcing Batman to end his retirement early. It's a very good story. It's called Nightfall. Tim was the Robin who was willing to hold it all together. Not Dick, definitely not Jason. Tim. Tim also took up the mantle of the leader of the Teen Heroes. First, he was a founding member of Young Justice alongside Connor and Bart. And then, when Young Justice merged with the Teen Titans, Tim was chosen to lead because he's Tim Drake. He is the obvious choice. He has an interesting relationship with the rest of the Robins. He and Dick understand each other and work well together. Jason initially hated Tim because Tim replaced him, but after they had a few punch-ups, Jason actually grew to respect Tim. Tim and Stephanie had a lot of respect for each other, we'll get to them later. And then Tim and Damien did not get along super well originally, but have leveled out. To be fair to Tim, when he premiered, Damien was the worst. Tim also briefly was forced to quit the Bat Family because his dad grounded Tim from being Robin. During that time, Tim's ex-girlfriend Stephanie Brown took over as Robin. It's unclear, but it sort of feels like she was Batman's rebound Robin after the Tim breakup. Either way, Stephanie Brown did not work out, we will get to it, and Tim was back. Eventually, his father was killed by Captain Boomerang, and Tim was officially orphaned. He also lost his best friend Superboy, which inspired his red and black costume. And then, after Batman dies during Final Crisis, which 
you know, in hindsight should be retitled like third most recent crisis. Tim is the Robin who wants to keep the mantle of Batman alive. Dick does not think it's a good idea. Jason tries to be the murder Batman, but Tim puts on the bat suit and goes to investigate the new murderous Batman. And he gets absolutely handled by Jason, who at this point has spent a decade training to be the world's best killer. However, Tim does get one absolutely wild shot in. He's knocked down, about to be killed by Jason. He reaches around on the floor and finds a crowbar. Jason Todd's weakness, which means one of two things. Either Jason has crowbars lying around, which Jason, bold choice, or Tim brought that crowbar just in case he needed to kill a Jason Todd. Either way, one of my favorite reveals in comics. It's such a fun progression of panels and then it's like crowbar. That is the most dangerous thing. It's so fun. This is where things get a bit messy. Damien takes over as Robin and Tim becomes Red Robin wearing a suit we first saw during Kingdom Come. It's my favorite of Tim's non-Robin costumes. In the new 52 reboot, you get another version of this costume with bird wings and a lot of straps. Like everybody had straps back then, it was pretty dumb. And very recently he was rebranded to Drake and got this costume. And yes, his name is Tim Drake and his superhero name is Drake. So besides the obvious foolishness when it comes to protecting his secret identity, it's also like, well, okay, what is this theme? Are you duck themed now? Cause that's, Terrible. Tim was the Robin who went to find Batman after he died and allied with Ra's al Ghul and since then has had his backstory messed around with a bit but more or less that is the story of Tim Drake. Let's talk about some essential characteristics. Our Tim needs to be smart. Not a complete nerd or a tech whiz but the same way that Batman has to just sort of feel like the smartest guy in the room. Tim needs to feel like someone who always has a plan. Always got ideas. He is determined. The only member of the Bat family, besides sort of Barbara, that did not fall into it or get grandfathered in. He is a normal kid who sets a goal and achieves it. Tim is also the best detective in the Bat family. And yeah, better than Batman, according to Batman himself. In fact, I would say Tim is the Robin who is just generally the most like Batman. He's the only one who really even wants to be Batman, which is fitting because he would so clearly be the best at it. But Tim is also the best Robin. He's the one who most understands the job of a Robin, to keep Batman grounded. Obviously, he's there to keep punching criminals too, but it's Robin's job to remind Batman what Batman is fighting for. And that makes it all the more confusing when Tim decides to be something besides Robin. Like I said, the original Red Robin was the best compromise because the costume felt like a real halfway point between Robin and Batman. But everything after that felt weird. He is Robin, so why is he doing this Drake thing? Or cosplaying as Falcon? We always knew Robin was where he would end up, so it's good that it's where the character is now, even if sometimes they call him Red Robin. The only exception is when, during the Battle for the Cowl, Tim was briefly Batman. It works, and it's clearly his destiny. Tim is also bisexual. It is a very recent development, although one fans had speculated about for a while. Specifically, Tim's relationship with Connor could be read as romantic, Last I checked, he was dating a deep cut Robin character named Bernard Dowd. Now, that does not invalidate his past relationships with Stephanie Brown or Wonder Girl, Cass, not Yara, Pam Fox, or even Jubilee for a hot minute, but it's part of his identity. Also, I want to clear this up now since it's going to come up with the next couple of these guys. Tim is almost always 16. It was as close to a canonical age as exists, although he does seem a bit older sometimes, so I'm going to be casting for someone who can play around a 16 year old. Tim is young optimistic, clever, eager, and determined to help Batman. Previous versions. I know last video I said I refused to watch Titans, but since it was the only decent Tim Drake representation, I watched his bit. He's played by Jay Lycurgo, and I didn't hate him. He hit all the regular Tim beats. Super eager Batman and Robin superfan who cracks Dick's identity and tries to join the team. There's a wild subplot where, spoiler alert, Tim saves Donna Troy, so he makes the show you know better in general. But that's not exactly it. Tim dies and goes to Heaven Train, where he meets Donna, and then he meets Hank, who died earlier that season, and inspires Donna to bring Tim back to Earth. And at the end of the season, Dick recruits Tim to train with him and presumably become the next Robin. Overall, solid portrayal of the character. It's worth noting that he is the first black Robin in live action, even though there was a point when one of the Wayans brothers was set to play Dick in a sequel to Batman 89. And Tim's race has never really been an important part of his character. He's usually just some white kid. I think Tim can be pretty much any race and it does not change anything about the character. In general, I think a lot of white characters in comics can be played by people of any race. Here's my thinking. All five of the original X-Men characters, plus Charles, and all of their early villains are white. 
even though the X gene is distributed essentially randomly through the population. Granted, white people made up about 85% of the population in the US at the time of the comics release, but that's not 100%. So why are there no black X-Men? They make up 11% of the population. It isn't like they didn't exist. People just weren't putting black characters in early comics. So those characters were not white for any good reason. White was just the default skin color for a superhero from the mid 1930s to the late 1960s. Stan Lee said it in his most important soapbox. Marvel comics represent the world outside our window. And the world outside our window in America, at least now, is pretty diverse. So even though all the early comic characters are white, I don't think they need to be. And yes, there are some characters like Cyclops or Tony Stark or Steve Rogers who I believe can be more interesting if they are white. Like there, there could be something to do there. Like Cyclops is the quintessential square jawed leader. So I think it's interesting if he looks like what that character is expected to look like the same way he's also supposed to be tall and buff. I think it's interesting to use Cyclops to examine those ideas and then break them down. The best X-Men comics do a great job at this. And then like Tony Stark needs to be the head of a family company that manufactures weapons for the military as far back as World War II, those are pretty much exclusively white. And then with Cap, I think it's interesting if the guy punching Hitler is the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white Superman that he always dreamed of, but this Superman wants nothing to do with Hitler. I, I just think that's interesting. Now I'm not saying when it comes to casting, certain characters should be made black because of tokenism, that's also not great. I just think there are quite a few characters, Tim Drake among them, whose whiteness has almost nothing to do with their character and they could be played by an actor of any race. So if I look at all the actors and determine that the most qualified one for the job is not white, I'm gonna go with that actor. So that's just my opinion, but when I'm doing these casting videos and you're like, why did he change this guy but not this guy? That's probably why. Only other appearance of note is the Batman Beyond movie Return of the Joker, which is essentially a Jason Todd story, but since Jason Todd did not happen in that universe, they used the new second Robin, Tim Drake, instead. The movie's fine and I love that ending, but this Tim is not anything to write home about. The runner's up. Gotta mention real quick that Jack Dylan Glazer would be a terrific Tim Drake if he was not already Freddie Freeman, AKA Captain Marvel Jr., but alas, it cannot be. I wanna throw this name out there and go with me. I really like Jacob Tremblay, the little kid from Room and Wonder. He's older now, an actual teenager at 15, but by the time this would start filming, he'd be 16. So he's the perfect Tim Drake age. Obviously, he's as solid as a child actor can be, but he's also just been doing really interesting stuff recently. I thought he was hilarious in Good Boys. I absolutely loved Luca, and he voices Damian Wayne in Harley Quinn currently. He's very funny and has an energy that could be very interesting here. Could he play an action hero? Maybe, but part of the fun of Tim Drake is that he does not seem like an action hero right out of the gate. He grows into it. And I think Jacob has the range to do that. Then we've got a bunch of the kids from that hot new 80s nostalgia horror property that's churning out tons of Tim Drakes. Not talking about Stranger Things, talking about it. Although real quick, I don't love Finn Wolfhard here. Don't know why, I just don't. Maybe it's because between it and Stranger Things and Ghostbusters, he feels sort of overexposed. He's not a bad actor, I just do not have strong feelings about him. Now his it co-stars are another story. First, we've got Jaden Martell. If you have not seen It, you will probably recognize him as either the Jacob from Defending Jacob, the Morty in that little live action thing, or the alt-right Thrombly child in Knives Out. He also shares a film credit with Jacob Tremblay, but that might be one of the worst studio movies in recent memory, so we're just going to ignore it. Jaden, like Jacob, does not feel like Jason or Dick. I can see him as an average kid who works his way up to being Robin. Then there's Wyatt Olaf. If you don't know Wyatt from It, you probably remember him from either I'm Not Okay With This, where he plays Stan, or from the Guardians movies, where he plays young Peter Quill. He's got a fun, nervous energy in I'm Not Okay With This. He's also 21, which is about as high as I think we can go without losing the teenager believability. And then we've got Chosen Jacobs, also from It, also stars in this strange little Cinderella remake about a boy who makes sneakers, seems talented, right age, the third kid from It who I think could do it. The winner. Joshua Bassett has everything. He's young, 21. He's the star of High School Musical, the show The Musical. The right balance of can believably be an action hero, but doesn't seem like one. He seems like he could be just another kid. He's also got the LGBTQ thing going, which is a nice bonus. And he's a singer, which could be handy if the music meister ever shows up. Honestly, casting Tim Drake comes down to not being too hunky like Dick or too rough like Jason. Tim is in the middle and he needs to have a lot of room to grow. So Joshua Bassett is my Tim Drake. Stephanie Brown. 
You know what? Cassandra Kane is dangerous. Nah, I'm just kidding. We'll do Stephanie. We'll do. We'll do Stephanie. Jokes aside, Stephanie Brown deserved better. While she was the fourth canonical Robin and the first canonical female Robin, it never really worked. Stephanie Brown was always a Robin in search of a persona. Stephanie started as the daughter of Great Value Riddler, aka Clue Master. He's a villain who leaves clues, so like riddles but lazy. He's one of the least significant Batman villains you may have heard of. For his entire career, Clue Master did not do anything that important, he just sort of was. And Stephanie, his daughter, wanted him to not do crimes because crime is wrong and also she probably wouldn't say this because she's nice, but it's probably pretty embarrassing having a dad who's a supervillain but is really bad at it. So Stephanie donned a purple hooded costume and created the identity of Spoiler. She helped the police and Batman by leaving the answers to her father's clues at the crime scene. This drew the attention of the Robin at the time, Tim Drake. And Stephanie flirted with Tim in a way that teenagers do. She knocked him in the face with a brick. Spoiler was sort of Tim's Catwoman. She's a vigilante who plays by her own rules and has a more outgoing personality than her all business counterpart. Speaking of teenager, back to the canonical ages of the Bat Family thing, Stephanie Brown is always around the same age as Tim, 16. This almost never changes, so we need an actor who can play high school aged convincingly. But after some misadventures, Tim was grounded from being Robin. Stephanie saw this as her chance to take on the mantle of Robin, and it didn't take. Stephanie was eager, and Batman was accepting of Stephanie as Tim's replacement, but the team up just didn't have that chemistry. It's like when you think your two single friends are going to hit it off because they're both single and looking for a partner and they're both great, but it just never clicked. And that's not just in the world of this story. In the real world, readers weren't really connecting with Stephanie Brown and DC editorial seemed to have no idea what to do with her. It probably had something to do with the fact that Stephanie Brown was following the best Robin, Tim Drake. Those are some immense shoes to fill. It also had something to do with the fact that Stephanie was not really the most anything. Dick was the most athletic Robin. Jason was the toughest. Tim was the smartest. What was Stephanie great at? Why was she a better Robin than either of those three? And I think the case could be made that Stephanie just being a girl is enough of a selling point. Like how is being a female Robin different from all of the male Robins before her? Besides the costume, of course. Does Stephanie solve problems differently? Does she face new challenges, different expectations, discrimination? There were avenues to explore, but you know, they just really didn't. And I think the other problem comes from the fact that besides not being all that special compared to Robin, Stephanie was also a lot like the very popular Barbara Gordon, aka Batgirl. Lighthearted, upbeat, eager, curious, made her own costume, dated a Robin. So Barbara had broken a lot of ground that really wasn't there for Stephanie to break. And while I'm sure some of the fans' apathy and distaste for the character came from her gender, I think the fact that another popular character had joined the Bat family around the same time and she was doing quite well, partially because of how her personality and upbringing made her unique in the field of Bat children, it shows that it can be done. And we'll get to her later. And I think the biggest indication that the writers weren't really that interested in exploring Stephanie's character is the fact that she does have a big point of difference from the other Robins, her family. Not only were most of the previous Robins orphans, none of them were related to a villain, at least not then. So I think there's something to the idea of Stephanie's relationship with her father and all of Gotham's organized crime coloring her experience as Robin. However, Clue Master was not really all that interesting, so that avenue was also a dead end. Speaking of dead ends, Stephanie Brown was looking for a way to prove herself to Batman. So she stole one of his plans to unite all of the crime bosses under one person and tried to implement it. Unfortunately, Stephanie misunderstood part of the plan and was tortured and beaten to death in the process, thus ending her very short Robin career. And this is where things get tricky. So it certainly seemed like Stephanie died, because she died. The little heart line went beep, total death. And Dr. Leslie Tompkins, who is a friend of Batman and was treating Stephanie's injuries, also just let Stephanie die to teach Bruce a lesson that kids should not be Robins, which, you know, was a little weird. Then Tompkins also left for a while, but it turns out that Dr. Tompkins did not kill Stephanie. She, in fact, seemed to kill her, but it was all a ploy to, I guess, get them both out of Gotham 
and make Bruce feel bad? It doesn't make a ton of sense, and it doesn't matter. Point is, Stephanie Brown is alive. So it's not a big deal that Batman never put up her Bat Memorial in the Bat Cave. He knew she wasn't dead. Sure. Stephanie comes back, a spoiler for a bit. Tries to reconnect with Tim, but it doesn't really work. Then Stephanie rejoins the Bat family and takes on the mantle of Batgirl. And she did pretty well. Foiled enemies, made friends, became close with Barbara and Damien, who we will get to. Stephanie was warm, positive, and felt very similar to Barbara's original Batgirl. Since then, things have been rebooted and relaunched, but that is more or less Stephanie's story. She is currently both Batgirl and spoiler, sort of. She's called Batgirl, but has a spoiler version of the costume. And since the series is Batgirls with Barbara, Stephanie, and Cassandra, who we will get to, and they've all been Batgirl at one time or another, you could be referring to any of them as Batgirl. Barbara even points this out. If they're going to be over comms, they need to figure out a way to distinguish who's talking to who. I really empathize with her there. I'm all for characters getting their own mantles. I think it's always cool. Essential characteristics. It's very important to me that the actor playing Stephanie Brown is a kid and feels like one, not a 30-year-old pretending to be in high school. Our Stephanie needs to be able to sell the optimism and naivety that comes with youth. Our Stephanie also needs to have a good attitude. I want someone with a lot of energy, chatting through the battle, sort of pestering her teammates. Stephanie should have the energy that can light up a room. That energy is very important because of how well it bounces off certain other Bat family members Tim, Cassandra, and Damien specifically. Stephanie is also incredibly driven. She was determined to be Robin after Tim left the job and she took over as Batgirl when Cassandra dropped the position. We need an actor who can be believably intense and focused enough to make that work. And it would certainly help if she had chemistry with our Tim Drake. Like I said, this isn't a one true pairing situation, but her relationship with Tim is what pulls Spoiler into the story, so I want their romance to be believable, or at least her side of it. Stephanie also needs to have good chemistry with our Cassandra. The two have become a team in the last few years, and they currently share a book and bunk beds, so our Stephanie needs to be able to work well with Cassandra, who is going to largely play the strong silent type. But most importantly, Stephanie needs to feel like sort of a mess. She's a work in progress, making mistakes, feeling like she needs to prove herself. Stephanie is not like all of these other Robins. She does not come in as an incredible gymnast or a genius. She's just another kid who wants to do some good to cancel out her father's bad. So she messes up, gets in over her head, but manages to adapt and carve out her own niche in the Bat Family. She's sort of the Bat Family's sister-in-law. Stephanie was brought into the family as a date, but over time, even though the relationship ended, she still comes to the cookout because she worked her way in and everyone loves her. Stephanie is likable, capable, and full of potential. Previous versions. As of now, there has only been one live action Stephanie Brown. I believe the character is going to appear on that Gotham Knights show, but who knows? With all the CWWB turmoil, I would not be surprised if we never see it, even though apparently it started filming today as of recording this. But speaking of the CW, Spoiler appears in the second season of Batman. She's played by Morgan Cohen in the episode I'll Give You a Clue. This version of Spoiler is an adult having foiled her father Clue Master's plans and put him in Blackgate five years ago. She joins up with Luke Fox to solve her dad's new clues and then they catch him. This version of Stephanie feels very CW. She's covered in tattoos that seem to be words written in a secret code. It's a very edgy, more adult version of Spoiler. I wouldn't say she's particularly fun or has much Stephanie Brown energy. Honestly, I think you could swap out Clue Master for Riddler and swap out Stephanie for Enigma, and it makes about as much sense. This character was just Clue Master's daughter. The runner's up. Maya Hawk is too old for this role, but her character on Stranger Things, Robin, has pure Stephanie Brown energy. She's friendly, bright, shares a little too much, but again, way too old. I want believable kids. I also keep writing off the Stranger Things cast, but I think in the right spots, they could be really effective. And this may be a good spot for Sadie Sink. We all know she's very talented as Max. She's also got a spot in the new Darren Aronofsky, Brendan Fraser comeback vehicle, The Whale. So I think she's got a bright future and would work really well here. And if you want an actor who just looks like Stephanie Brown, Lulu Wilson has the Stephanie Brown look down. I have not seen Hill House because I am a coward but she is coming back for the House of Usher show, and she seems like she's capable from the clips I've watched, so she could do it. Also wanna throw in Jenna Ortega. I think she's great in the second The Babysitter movie. I've not seen X, but I've heard good things. Also have not seen Scream, 
I don't know what it is with all these actors and horror movies, but there's a lot of horror movies in there. Either way, she's been working for a decade on shows like Jane the Virgin, You, and the Richie Rich show that apparently exists. In The Babysitter 2, she's got a very chaotic energy, and I think that could absolutely work for Stephanie. Then we've got Elsie Fisher. Starred in 8th Grade, which is a very tough movie that she handled very well. Also solid recently in a couple episodes of Barry. This is just one of those good actors who I'm like, yeah, they could probably do it. Right age? Sure. The winner. One of the only consistent bits of praise coming out of the Ghostbusters reboot was how much McKenna Grace worked as Phoebe. And for all of those reasons, I think she would also make a solid Stephanie Brown. She's been able to handle drama in The Handmaid's Tale. She has also been in the business for a while. Her first role was in 2013, which means she has been acting since she was seven. And I'm not the biggest fan of child stars. But I think there is something to being able to stick around this long and keep a relatively low profile. I think that's valuable, especially for a franchise player. You want someone who you can depend on. I've watched a bunch of interviews with Grace and her energy is perfect for Stephanie. And on Young Sheldon, she plays Paige who is a kid who's some sort of rival to young Sheldon. Listen, I watched some of this show, it is what it is, but it's also a pretty good Stephanie Brown audition tape. A solid mix of being a big nerd, but also sort of a troublemaker who shows up every so often to make the nerdy main character's life difficult. But also, they're friends maybe, I don't know. Either way, I think McKenna Grace would make a great Stephanie Brown. And the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know what? If McKenna Grace wants to bring along her Ghostbusters Afterlife co-star Finn Wolfhard, he'd be a fine Tim Drake. I don't, I don't like I. I feel like he doesn't stand out as not Tim Drake. -y. He's he'd be, he'd be fine. Again, he's just one of those actors who I feel like is a little bit too iconic of a performance where it's like, could he like believably take over this role, or would it be like the Stranger Things kid in a Robin costume? That's my big issue there. But either way, he's a good enough actor. I'm sure he could do the role justice. Cassandra Kane is dangerous. Cassandra Kane had a fairly standard childhood. This is like the third time I've made that joke, but hers may honestly be one of the weirder ones. She's the daughter of master assassin David Kane. Now, this is super important because it might not be clear from my voice. Kane is spelled C A I N. That is different from the Kane family that gave us Bruce's mom Martha and his cousin Kate Kane, aka Batwoman. That Kane is spelled K A N E. If you want an easy way to remember, C A I N is how you spell the Kane from Cain and Abel, who is, according to the Bible, the first murderer. So, David Kane and his daughter Cassandra Kane share a name with a murderer and they are assassins. Simple enough. Anyway, David Kane was a master assassin, one of the best in the DC universe. Like, Deadshot is one of the best, and he trained Deadshot. Kane also trained Bruce Wayne as part of Bruce's quest to become a borderline superhuman fighter. But David Kane wanted a partner in crime, someone at his level. So David trained a bunch of young kids, but it never really worked out. And then David had an idea. He is a master assassin. Maybe some of that is genetic. So he decided to have a kid who he could raise as the ultimate assassin. David Kane met and fell in love with another assassin named Sandra Wu San, who would eventually be known as Lady Shiva. Just kidding. David scouted Shiva out, killed her sister, kidnapped Shiva, and in exchange for her life, forced her to be the mother to his murder child. Great stuff. And while this is the first Bat family member to be born under pretty gross circumstances, it will not be the last. So Shiva agreed and nine months later gave birth to Cassandra. David raised Cassandra to be the ultimate weapon, teaching her every form of martial arts known to man. Cassandra was also raised without any speech. David never spoke to Cassandra, and she never knew to speak to him. Her language was combat, which gave Cassandra the ability to read people's movements. So she could tell what people are going to do before they even know they're going to do it. But as a consequence, Cassandra never learned to speak or write or anything like that. Besides using her own body language, Cassandra did not have any way of communicating with anyone. And then after something like nine years, David sent Cassandra on a mission where she made her first kill. And this broke Cassandra. She thought this was just more training, that it was fake, but she had actually taken a life and she didn't want to do that. So Cassandra quit, ran away from home. Now this is where it gets a little hazy. In the original continuity, pre-New 52, Cassandra helped out during the 1999 DC event called No Man's Land. Basically, there was a big earthquake in Gotham, and in all of the chaos, the Bat villains took control of the city, and the United States government declared Gotham a No Man's Land. They do it all the time in the movies, no one even did it twice. One of the villains hired David Kane as an assassin, and Cassandra showed up to foil his plans. 
Batman recognized that Cassandra was A, a goon-destroying machine, and B, looking to do some good. So he drafted her and she became the second official Batgirl, if you ignore Betty Kane back in the 60s and Huntress earlier that year. You've probably seen this costume. It's the black Batgirl outfit with a piece of fabric sewn on to cover the mouth, because she doesn't talk. Or at least, she did not talk until she was taken in by Barbara Gordon, the original Batgirl, who taught Cassandra some words. Also, a psychic scrambled her brain, giving her the ability to speak, but robbing her of her fighting language. I think it got reversed, who knows. But over time, Cassandra learned to speak, even though she frequently chooses not to. Cassandra eventually reunited with her mom, the two fought a bunch, and then a storyline happened that we all choose to ignore, where Cassandra took over the League of Assassins and killed a bunch of people. But like I said, we ignore that. Then Cassandra joined the Teen Titans that were then led by Deathstroke. Then she returned to her original role as Batgirl as part of the Outsiders, and then teamed up with Ravager and a new sister named Mark to stop David Kane and Deathstroke from creating a team of young female assassins. Then Cassandra quit being Batgirl after Batman's death and moved to Hong Kong. There she took up the mantle of Black Bat as part of Batman Incorporated. Then we got the big franchise-wide reboot known as New 52, and Cassandra's story sort of changed. She is still the mute assassin child of David Kane who shows up in Gotham to foil his plans, but her dad sacrifices himself to save her, so Cassandra takes up his code name, Orphan, and she dresses a lot like Hawkeye does when he's Ronin. And this time, she probably also did not do the League of Assassin murders. Cassandra has worked with the Bat Family ever since, and is currently part of the Bat Girls team with Barbara Gordon and Stephanie Brown. They all live in a brownstone together. It's great. Cassandra Kane is a generally popular character among fans. Her origin is interesting, her ability to read people's body language sets up fun fights, and she adds an interesting dynamic to the Bat Family. She is quiet dangerous and obsessive. But that's not to say she does not have friends. Cassandra and Stephanie get along really well. I think they're a terrific team because of how well they complement one another. Stephanie is outgoing, fun-loving, and chatty. Cassandra is private, serious, and still. But Cassandra keeps Stephanie in line, and Stephanie makes sure Cassandra has fun. And she does have fun. Cassandra's not always scowling. She loves art, especially dance, and she enjoys a good fight. Cassandra's also pretty good friends with Tim and Dick, even though there was a while where Dick didn't really trust her. But Bruce always believed in Cassandra Kane. Early on, he recognized that Cassandra is willing to sacrifice anything to protect people, which is why Bruce always tries to keep her on the team, even after some of her more unheroic moments. It's hard to nail this down, especially with Damien in the mix, who we will get to, but I do think Cassandra is the Bat Family member who is the most like Bruce. They share a passion. Cassandra is driven by her guilt the same way Bruce is driven by his loss. And that's why, besides maybe Tim, Cassandra feels like the obvious Bat successor to Bruce. She has been through it, has been trained by the same assassins that trained Bruce. She takes crime fighting as seriously as Bruce, and she's got the same superhuman competence that Bruce has when he's in a fight. Like, there's this great scene in Tynan's Batman run where the good guys are being ambushed by a bunch of Black Ops soldier types, and all of the rest of the Bat family members are fighting them together, and then they're like, oh wait, what about Cassandra? She's all alone with a bunch of soldiers. And then they go check on her, and she's just standing over a bunch of knocked out goons, and she's smiling. Not in a creepy way, but in a, oof, that was something sort of way. It's where this image comes from. The only thing Tim Drake really has on Cassandra is his intelligence intelligence, and specifically engineering and programming genius. It's not necessarily a blind spot of Cassandra's, but it's definitely not what she's known for. The two of them have pretty much all the Batman skills between them. It would be an interesting couple, honestly. I don't think that's ever happened before. She did date Superboy for a minute, so maybe a Tim, Cassandra, Connor, Thruple? I don't know. This uh, shipping is not my thing. And when it comes to ethnicity, Cassandra is definitely half white on her father's side. However, Lady Shiva has a more ambiguous origin. For a while, we did not know where she was from. Then we learned she grew up in an unnamed fictional Asian country. Then in 2020, I believe it was retconned to be China. And as far as comic continuity goes, the usual rule is that the most recent continuity is the correct one. So for now, Lady Shiva is from China. And she's also named after a Hindu god for some reason that's never really been explained. Either way, in 2022, that makes Cassandra half white and half Chinese. Cassandra is also canonically around 18 years old. This one isn't quite as set in stone as Tim or Stephanie, but late teens is usually where she lands. She is older than Tim, but younger than Jason. Also, in case you're curious about all her code names, Cassandra has gone by a few, and personally, I'm not a huge fan of any of them. First, there's Orphan, which should work, except it's her abusive father's code name, so that doesn't really play. 
Then you've got Black Bat, which is cool sounding, except I don't think black is a great way to distinguish yourself from Batman. He wears a lot of black, like Red Bat, Green Bat, those work. But I think Black Bat sounds like if She-Hulk called herself Green Hulk or Wally West was Red Flash. And then you've got Batgirl, which is definitely the best of the three, but it is not exclusively hers. And I would definitely not say she's the person that comes to mind when I think of Batgirl. That's obviously Barbara Wilson from Batman and Robin. So yeah, she doesn't have anything that works as well as like Spoiler or Nightwing. That's why I mostly call her Cassandra Cain. Although in the video title, I may do Batgirl since, you know, SEO. Essential characteristics. It's funny to me how many other comic book characters Cassandra is a lot like. Bred to be an assassin, daughter of a super badass. Sounds a lot like Laura Kinney. Nonverbal master of hand-to-hand -hand combat with the ability to predict her opponent's moves, who happens to also have been raised by a supervillain. That's Echo. And both of them came after Cassandra, so they were definitely influenced by her. But when it comes to vibes, Cassandra reminds me most of Kimiko from The Boys, the show not the comic. Kimiko is an East Asian master assassin who also happens to be mute. In Kimiko's case, she was traumatized when her parents were murdered and has not spoken ever since. But she does communicate by writing and with sign language, so it's very similar. But more than that, Kimiko captures the spirit of Cassandra. Kimiko loves music and dancing. She starts out sort of dark and distant because of the abuse she suffered as a child, but warms up to members of the team and becomes very friendly. Kimiko even has moments where she beats up a room of goons with a smile on her face. That's what I want from a Cassandra. Someone with a lot of pathos. A big tragic backstory who, because of the people around her, is able to transition to more of a friendly figure. Also, she needs to be able to communicate without much speech. And if she's in her Batgirl costume without any facial movements either. We need someone who can emote with posture and movement. Might be a good idea to look at actors with experience in theater, since they're trained to play to the cheap seats. I imagine our Cassandra also needs to be a believable master of martial arts. This does not mean that she needs to be one, just seem like one. Because she will be far and away the most dangerous member of the Bat family in a fight. In her new 52 reintroduction, she absolutely handles every other Bat family member. So she's gotta be tough. And like I said, I want someone who can play around 18, which means 25 is the limit and they should be at least half East Asian. Chinese is ideal, but since that is such a recent development, I don't think it's absolutely essential to the character. Previous versions. I don't want to restate the whole thing, but my Birds of Prey One Small Change video sums up pretty succinctly why the Cassandra Kane in that movie is not Cassandra Kane. But in case you don't have the time, you've heard everything I said about Cassandra, right? Well, the Birds of Prey version is a streetwise, precocious, chatty child who lives in the same rundown apartment building as Black Canary. It's about as far from Cassandra as you can get. It's honestly pretty impressive. The actor, Ella J. Basco, is also too young. She's currently 15. Nothing against her performance, but don't expect to see her on my list. The runner's up. Couple I'm not in love with, but could do it. Also, Karen Fukuhara, who plays Kimiko on The Boys, is currently 30. I don't think she could believably play 18, and also I don't love double casting comic book characters if they've already played pretty much the same guy. Couple others I'm not totally in love with, but I think could do it. Walking Dead's Sydney Park, that is an action show, kind of. Lots of walking around mostly, but sometimes they do a stab every so often. Could be a good spot for her. Alright, listen, I really like my winner, so I'm going to speed this up. You've also got Chelsea Zhang, who is way too qualified for this because she played Ravager on Titans. Maybe a little on the nose, but you know, she could do it. One person I came across while looking up young, up-and-coming East Asian actresses was Leah Lewis, who you'd probably most likely know from The Nancy Drew Show. She's also got a part in that new Pixar movie where what if fire and water were friends. Anyway, I go check out her IMDb page to see if there's anything else I recognize, and look what I find. Cassandra Kane in the Batwheels cartoon. So, that's a pretty good start. Might be a good live-action Cassandra too. Who knows? The winner. Feels like this is probably like the fifth time I brought her up in one of these, but I don't care. Lana Condor. I don't know. Maybe I just feel like after Jubilee, she deserves a good one of these. 25, so right on the age limit, but I think she could play 19 if she needed to. Also, I've never brought this up before because I never watched it, but Lana played Saya on the show Deadly Class, and Saya is a Yakuza assassin who puts walls up because of her dark past. So like, that's a solid Cassandra. Now she's finally making it onto the big board. Lana Condor is my Cassandra Kane. Damian Wayne, 
is a handful. First impressions matter, and I don't care how much fun Super Sons is, I don't know if I will ever be able to get this image out of my head when I think of Damian Wayne. And that's the problem with the character, there are essentially two versions of Damian. The first was introduced in Batman number 655, although he was sort of first shown in the Son of the Demon story from 1999. In the originally out of continuity story, Bruce had a love affair with Talia al Ghul, which results in her pregnancy. This sort of messes with Bruce, he becomes a more nervous, careful version of Batman because of this new responsibility. So Talia, seeing how much the world needs the old Batman, pretends to miscarry the child, and Bruce doesn't think much of it. It's revealed at the end of the book that Talia kept the child and gave it up for adoption, the end. Fast forward to 2006, Talia is causing all sorts of man-bat related trouble, and after Batman has foiled her plans, Talia reveals that she and Batman have a son. Bruce is like, wait, what? And then we are introduced to Damian Wayne, which first small nitpick with Damian, he says he thought Batman would be taller. Batman's pretty tall. He's, he's a tall guy, and Damian's very small, so that's a weird move. Here's my first real knock against Damian Wayne. His origin is gross. Writer Grant Morrison sort of forgot how the Son of the Demon story went, and when putting it into main DC canon, changed a few things. Obviously in this version, Talia does not give the baby up for adoption, but also Batman was not a willing participant in the baby making. Talia drugged Bruce and had her way with him. It is a dumb change that did not need to exist at all besides maybe giving Bruce a reason why he never looked for this kid. I guess if he knew it could exist, he would keep an eye on it since he's Batman, but this way Bruce did not even know that was a possibility. However, it, it's just a stupid weird choice that did not need to be this way. Second knock against Damien, he didn't feel all that unique. Let's run that origin back. A master assassin with ties to Batman's past wants to create the perfect assassin. So they force another expert fighter to help them conceive a child who they train in solitude for about 10 years before the child is unleashed upon the world, runs into Batman, and eventually becomes a reformed member of the Bat family. Sound familiar? We already did that origin with Cassandra Cain a little over a decade earlier. The only big differences were A, Damien's a boy, B, he didn't have those gap years that Cassandra did, and C, he was Batman's biological son. But besides that, the whole master assassin child with rough edges who warms up to the Bat family, it just didn't feel fresh. So anyway, Bruce takes Damien in, brings him to the Bat Cave, introduces him to Alfred and Tim, and this is where things really go off the rails. Damien beheads some guy, puts a grenade in his mouth, and then nearly kills Tim, and worst of all, he says a bad language word to Alfred. He's a spoiled, entitled little brat who only wants to kill. And it's not the character's fault, but man, he was hard to like in the old days. Damien goes back with his mom for a little bit, and there's this strange story involving a reanimated Ra's al Ghul trying to revive himself using Damien's body. It's not important. Damien comes back to Gotham and continues to be a huge brat until Batman dies during Final Crisis in 2008, and Damien is sort of reset emotionally and editorially. He loses most of his extremely disagreeable tendencies and just turns into your average bratty kid. He doesn't follow orders, steals the Batmobile, thinks he's better than everyone else, but that's something we can work with, a character with some room to fit into this eclectic family. It reminds me of that episode of The Office where Michael ruins his improv performances by always improving a gun. It breaks the scene gives you nowhere to go, it can't get more exciting, and everything becomes sort of pointless. In my mind, Damien was the gun. Too extreme, too violent, we always knew what he was going to do, and we couldn't connect with his problems because he was so extreme. So turning the knob down from 11 to 8 on the murder scale did a lot of good. And with that softening, you're able to get to the nuance of Damien. He was bred to be the heir to the Bat Mantle. And not only is he not the most qualified kid for that job, he's not even very good at it when he starts off. His murderous tendencies that were drilled into his head by his mother make him a pretty awful successor to Batman, so Damien needs to change. He becomes Dick Grayson's Robin after Dick becomes Batman, and this is where fans really started to have fun with Damien. He was still a little stabby for the family's taste, but he also got some very likable qualities. He's competent, he has convictions, he wants to honor his father's legacy, and he's able to be a kid. One of my favorite Damien moments comes in issue 17 of the Stephanie Brown Batgirl series, where she goes on a mission with Damien as Robin and realizes that while he might be a solid Robin, he's a lousy kid. He doesn't know what a field trip is. He can't enjoy this big bubble thing. So after they complete their mission, Stephanie takes Damien to a bouncy house. 
Damien protests and then pretends he's not having fun, but he smiles a little. Damien does not know how to have fun, but Stephanie is all about that. So she and Damien share that experience and it's cute. But not knowing how to be a kid is not Damien's biggest weakness. He is incredibly, unbelievably, superhumanly arrogant. He believes he is the best at literally everything. And when anyone questions him, Damien explains that he's cool and sweet and they're dumb and what he says goes. He loves to take charge and make plans without usually informing the rest of the team of the plan because why do they need to know? He's Damien Wayne. He's always right. They'll just disagree and they'll need to argue, which is pointless because he's obviously correct, so why bother? And then when the plan inevitably falls apart, Damien barely ever admits his mistakes. And it would be annoying if he were Nightwing's age, but he's 13, so it's kind of cute. He also says things like, they will taste my steel, referring to his signature weapons, a pair of swords, and it's silly because he's little. And we have not really covered signature weapons, but real quick, Dick uses a scream of sticks, Kate uses guns, Barbara sometimes uses gadgets and tends to stick to batarangs, Jason also uses guns, Tim uses a bow staff, Cassandra is a weapon, Stephanie uses... Um... I think she had like a three section staff once, so... I guess that, and Damien uses swords. And even though Damien is all kinds of irritating, he does have some close friends. Most notably, he's very good friends with the other super son, Jonathan Kent. They grew up together as chronicled in the book Super Sons, and they were a pretty perfect pairing. Damien was able to take Jonathan out of his comfort zone, and Jonathan was able to call Damien out on his nonsense. Damien is also a member of the Teen Titans, and he is great at getting on their nerves, especially since he's the youngest member of the team at the minimum age of 13. But he's still incredibly bossy, because that's just Damien. The problem is he's right when it comes to a lot of things, so he can back his ego up. Damien is also, beyond being an expert fighter and strategist, an expert hacker and programmer, much like his father. And in the Bat family, Damien has managed to make a lot of close connections over the years. Alfred and Dick acted as surrogate father figures when Bruce was air quotes dead. Tim and Damien also managed to reconcile after Damien almost killed Tim. And like I said, Stephanie and Damien have a fun relationship. It's strange to me that I cannot remember much between Damien and Jason or Cassandra since they're the other two super ninjas trained by assassins, but maybe they're just too similar or maybe I missed those books. That I said that's probably it. Overall, Damien is a tragic figure, like Cassandra, raised to be a living weapon by an assassin and unable to always disconnect from those impulses. But he clearly wants to be better, to live up to his father's legacy, and he even does in the deceased comic taking on the mantle of Batman. Like I said, I think Tim and Cassandra are better Bat successors for now, but Damien is set to inherit that legacy. Honestly, the thing that he needs most is the ability to find his own destiny, get out from under Batman's shadow, and he's definitely working on that. Also, I didn't mention this yet, but Damien did die once. He was killed by an older clone of himself, and then everyone kept stealing Damien's body, and Batman had to keep going and getting it. It was a whole thing. That story's where the Hellbat armor comes from, so it's pretty cool. Also, we've not nailed this down yet either. When Damien was introduced to Bruce, he was 10. After the rebirth event, he was 13. That's why he was able to join the Teen Titans. At that time, Jonathan was, I believe, 10. Damien is currently 14, and not that this matters, but Jonathan is now 18 because of a wormhole or something editorial wanted him to be older, I don't know. But Damien has an unusually fluid age for a comic book character, going from 10 to 14 over, you know, a reasonable amount of time. And this is going to make things tricky, because I do think Damien's age is a crucial part of his character. He is 14 max, and a lot of this characterization doesn't work if he's older, like 17. It becomes way less charming. But while a 22-year-old actor may be able to convincingly play 17, a 17-year-old is going to have a hard time playing 14. It's the puberty line. Once you cross it, you cannot play younger again. But here's a question. If we are casting Damien, is there any specific ethnicity the actor should be? After all, we want to accurately represent the character, and I would not want to cast, say, just an African-American actor if the character is actually, oh, I don't know, indigenous Australian. Everybody makes mistakes, so let's figure that out. Bruce Wayne is traditionally white, although also maybe ethnically Jewish, but that seems like the writers did it by accident, and it's also not something the comics have ever really explored, so I'm not going to focus on it here either. Plus, the way I understand it, that passes down through the mother so Bruce wouldn't do that with Damien, so it doesn't really matter in this instance. But then that brings up a very complicated question. What about Talia, and more specifically, Ra's al Ghul? What is their race slash ethnicity? Do they even have one? Well, 
buckle up. First, Talia's mother. She is a woman named Melisande who Ra's al Ghul met at a concert, adorable, and she is of mixed Chinese and Arab descent, simple enough. Ra's al Ghul has a background that I would describe as ambiguous for the sake of menace. I would describe it that way and so would Neil Adams, Ra's co-creator, who said, we created an equal to Batman and that's what Ra's al Ghul is all about. He's not necessarily Arabic, he's not necessarily Eastern, he's not necessarily Western, he's not necessarily anything, he's just a villain and an equal to Batman. However, that's not the end of it. Sometimes the comics make it a little bit more explicit that he is East Asian, sometimes he's Eastern Roman, so pretty big gap. He's also called Ra's al Ghul, which is Arabic for the demon's head, so is he Arabic? Not necessarily. It's something he picked up after he settled in the area, since that's where the Lazarus Pits, his source of immortality, seem to be the most plentiful. So it's his nickname translated into the local language. Is he appropriating their culture? Absolutely, but he's a bad guy, so it tracks. People have looked into Raish's backstory and determined that since he was born around the time of the Crusades, and he seemed to worship a deity named Bisu, that would suggest he was of generally Arabic descent, although he is apparently part of some now extinct nomadic culture. Also, his dad is Chinese, even though he is named Sensei, because those Al Ghul men love picking up names from all over the place. That all goes to say. I think Ra's al Ghul has been explained to be some mix of East Asian, usually Chinese and Arabic, but according to the character's creator, he can be whatever you want as long as the actor playing him is scary. Liam Neeson? Absolutely. Matthew Noble, why not? David Warner, sure. Oded Fair, Lance Reddick, Jason Isaacs, Giancarlo Esposito, hell yeah. The Gotham guy, haven't seen it hard maybe. But as you can see, it's a group of people from all over the place. So I think Damien is a quarter wild card on his grandpa's side. In conclusion, Damien is something like a quarter Chinese, a quarter Arabic, and half Caucasian. That certainly narrows it down. Listen, I was not able to find that actor. A boy in the area of 10 to 14 with that specific mix. I looked, haven't found him. So we're going to be a little bit more general here and to work with what we got. Essential characteristics. Like I said, Damien needs to be younger than every other member of the Bat family, and I also don't think you can do a story where he's the first Robin. I think that would be a disservice to the character, so the ages of respective Robins is important. But like all not-so-great child actors, it's actually a positive if Damien sounds like an adult. He needs to speak clearly and formally. So a wonder kid would actually work here. He needs to be able to be a huge brat, but what kid and specifically what child actor can't? And I can say that because I was a bratty child actor back in the day. I think it's also important that Damien can be funny. Like it helps if this kid understands what is so funny about Damien taking control of a runaway school bus and saying, this is a man's job. But Damien is also a very tragic character. This won't be an easy role. We need an actor who can cry. We need to be able to see years of pain behind their eyes. It's a big ask. Previous versions. There has never been a live action Damien Wayne. Probably because he's impossible to cast, but also probably because these movies can barely get a Dick Grayson story off the ground, so it's gonna take a lot of movies in a row before Damien Wayne makes sense. He has showed up in plenty of animated material voiced by Stuart Allen. He's been playing this role since 2014, which means he was 13 when he started, and he did a great job. It's probably the voice most people associate with the character. He's got the perfect mix of arrogant and childish. Then you've got Harley Quinn's Jacob Tremblay, who I love as Damien. He's got a bat hoverboard, he's a total brat. I think the performance is a super fun parody of that character. The runner's up. Here we go. I'm just gonna throw this out there. I could not find someone of that mix and that age. The big problem is it's really tough to find an actor who is both still very young and also good. Like there's plenty who I'm like, yeah, he's, he's, he's fine. But Damien is supposed to sound like an adult. He's the opposite of big. I haven't seen that movie little. I'm assuming that's what that is. But Damien is supposed to sound like a poorly written child character who sounds like an adult. A whole movie of this kid. And I love this movie, even though it makes fun of New Balances, a shoe that I have a surprising amount of brand loyalty to for some reason. But that's the vibe, and it needs to be intentional. It's a tough cast. I could only find maybe like six actors who I think could actually do it. It's really seven, but you'll see. So I do apologize for not nailing the canonical ethnicity of Damien. Also, two actors that I think are too old, which is a real shame. Number one, Jacob Tremblay, who voices Damien on Harley Quinn. Could be fun, talented actor, but I don't think he could convincingly play 14 anymore. And then, number two, number five, Aiden Gallagher. He's 19, would have been perfect half a decade ago, 
but it just doesn't work anymore. And it's a shame, but it doesn't play. All that being said, here are my picks. Jackson Robert Scott. Okay, this kid's a strong start. He's 14 years old, so right on the limit. He's been in a bunch of horror or semi-horror movies. He's able to play like in The Prodigy, Creepy, which is right up Damien's alley. He also has, in Lock and Key, a very precocious energy that I believe Damien needs to have. As far as acting ability, pretty good. I like what I saw in Lock and Key. And don't ask me about Prodigy because, you know, coward. But this kid could do it. Next, I was not originally going to put Ian Armitage on this list because the idea of young Sheldon being Batman's assassin son felt a little silly. But the kid is good. Like, he's the lead in a long-running sitcom and he's 13. He's funny, he's a brat, got a solid scowl, and can talk like an adult, so I don't hate him. He might be a good pick. He was also the voice of young Shaggy in Scoob, and he's going to be in the Scoob holiday special, which I am so excited for. I cannot wait until it is released on HBO Max. Wait, what? Here's an idea. What about the Cravetti brothers? A set of identical twins, both currently 14, obviously. Like, this identical twin is actually four years older. Anyway, they just got done being the leads in the unnecessary remake of the horror movie Goodnight Mommy. Also, very well known for being in Big Little Lies alongside Ian Armitage. You have no idea how much I am fighting the urge to just call this kid Young Sheldon. Anyway, like the rehearsal taught us, a set of twins can be a real asset on set when it comes to child labor laws, and I think they look similar enough that they can honestly swap places and play the same character like the Olsen twins. And as they get older, this will probably change, but at least for now, I think it's possible, and in the future, we got a great stand-in. Then you've got my second runner-up, Samaritan's own Javon Walton. I have not seen Euphoria, where he plays a character named Ashtray, but I've seen Samaritan and Umbrella Academy, where he plays Stan in Season 3. And in both, I think he's pretty good. Funny enough, and strangely ripped, like this kid is a boxing champion, so probably the most prepared for stunts and stuff out of everyone here. If he were 14, absolutely. But he's 16, and he still looks maybe young enough, but I don't know if he could pull it off for long so I don't think he's realistic. A similar problem with my first runner-up, Chance Hurstfield. I hadn't heard of him before he came up when I was looking for other movies, but he plays Billy Weenan in the movie Fat Man, which is a violent Santa action movie made in 2020, starring Mel Gibson, which sure, I guess he's back. Anyway, this kid is the villain, and he's pretty good, and he has the Damien thing down, but he's 15, and I think he is also almost aged out of it, which is a bummer. The winner. Took me a while to find Walker Scobell, but I think out of all the child actors who can play bratty adult like children, he might be the best out there. You may remember Walker from The Adam Project, where he plays the younger Adam and does a really good job of keeping up with Ryan Reynolds. He's funny and he's familiar with action movies. On top of that, he is also going to be playing the titular Percy Jackson on Disney+, Plus, which goes to show that they believe in him. I do think if they dyed this kid's hair to match whoever plays Batman, he could do it. Be a snotty little brat with ninja swords. I don't know. Casting Damien is tricky, but this is as close as I can find to an actor who I think could handle the role and is within the right age range. So Walter Scoble is my Damien Wayne. And those are the big eight. The eight most historically significant members of the Bat family that do not currently exist in live action films, at least not ones I can watch. But also, if anybody on the WB lot wants to hook me up with a Batgirl screening, I will go. I will watch it on your phone, I will make a trip to LA to do other things, but also to see this movie. Regardless, those are the big eight, but they're not the only eight. I have one video that I put out a month ago casting some of the air quotes older Bat Family members, which are Bat Might, Carrie Kelly, and Asriel. With this video, I'm going to cast the most significant newer members of the Bat Family, Signal, Batwing, and my personal favorite, Ghostmaker. My apologies to Misfit, who could probably be played by any of the Carrie Kellys. So you can watch both of those videos right now on Nebula. Here's how you can do that, because Nebula is a subscription streaming service that I helped to create, and we have a partnership with this video sponsor, Curiosity Stream, where you get a subscription to Curiosity Stream's awesome documentaries like In Love with the Samurai Sword, if you're Damian Wayne, and you also get access to everything on Nebula. All my videos early, ad-free, without these sponsor bits, and you get to watch all the bonus videos. And you can get the bundle for less than $2 a month. It is such a good deal. It's pretty incredible. So go to curiositystream.com slash Nando to sign up and watch both of my Bat Family casting companion videos. Also, thank you to my patrons. You guys are incredible. Listen to Mostly Nitpicking, my podcast. Follow me on Twitter. Also, I've got a second channel for other videos. What kind of videos? You have to go there to find out. It is currently called The Nando Cut. Subscribe, watch, Stay safe, I'll see you next time.